so here's the route on that Antarctic tour everyone's talking about. And as you can see, it's just part of the deception. For years, people have hinted around us that something just doesn't sit right. In our cartoons, Sesame Street, The Simpsons, and others. The lies and deception are all around us, but one thing stands tried and true, and it's very simple, and there is but one Savior, and His name is Jesus Christ. So I gotta ask, if you don't believe in space, what do you think about Elon Musk and his company Fake X, SpaceX? SpaceX? More like... But seriously guys, do you really think this guy is for free speech running around the Met Gala and this jacket? What does that say? Novus Ordo Socorum. And where have we seen that? And what does that mean? New World Order or New World Age? But if you think that was just a coincidence, I got way more stuff to show you that, well, this guy is not the most honest guy. Like, does anyone else remember that time we caught a rat running around on the outside of his rocket? Remember, that's gonna continue to burn until eight minutes and 44 seconds into flight. So a little over two minutes from now, we'll hear the call out Seco. It'll then be a little- Did you guys catch it? Here, watch it again, but slowed down and zoomed in. Or remember that time he said he sent his electric car out to orbit Earth, but there was a little glitch. You can tell it's real because it looks so fake. You remember those words, Elon? But was he trying to tell us something here? Now I'm not saying Elon, fake it, I mean SpaceX is putting on a complete show. They do have some real rockets. And of course, all this was for entertainment purposes only. This is strictly my opinion. I so did not want to believe in flat earth. I mean, I have an open mind. I always said, the world is so insane and crazy that anything is possible. So I do have an open mind. And for a while now, I've been thinking, come on, is it possible flat earth? It's not possible. We see planets. What? But truth seeking is important, so let's get into it. This is what NASA tells us we are living on. This is what the Bible tells us we are living on. And then flat earthers. So take it for what it is. I was told that the flat earth theory is true. So from what I saw, flat. I decided to make this video for all the Christians who um, don't believe in evolution but still think the globe model is the correct model. The heliocentric model is the complete opposite to what the Bible actually teaches. The Bible teaches that the earth is immovable on pillars contained and that the sun and the luminaries move and we are stationary, that it is a circle that God is above and he watches us like grasshoppers. I want to make it clear that the same people that are telling you that evolution is true are the same people that are bringing you this Copernican heliocentric model that states that we are just a speck in the universe, unimportant, tucked away in a corner and are heading directly for another galaxy to collide and that'll be the end of the universe. But the Bible clearly teaches that that's not the case, that we are special. We are the center of creation, very important, God's chosen ones. So I think it's important to show you some scientific truths because science has actually been hijacked by Satan. He's used it now 
to go against the Bible. He's used it to trick people into believing a narrative when, in fact, real science actually directly proves God. And I can show you that in this video. NASA in Hebrew means to deceive, beguile. Um, so this obviously goes right back to the Garden of Eden. You can even see that the logo for NASA is a serpent tongue. I'm going to play a small clip from the Great Creation debate with Dean Odell and Greg Locke, and I'm having him explain why it matters. Yeah, but many Christians ask, why does it matter? Or just say the issue of the nature of creation doesn't matter. I'm going to tell you why it matters. And you're going to see this. Now, before we get to that, I want you to see Jesus said this. This is Matthew 24. This is Jesus talking. These are in your red letters here. Jesus said that immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven. He didn't say meteorites, comets, he said the stars. It's the same word he used throughout the Bible for the stars. Now, either they're stars or they're not stars. Now, the heliocentric Copernican model that you guys, some of you want to believe in, says that the stars out there are bigger, are, are massive, bigger than the earth. They're, they're huge things. That if one fell to the earth, it would swallow the earth. So Jesus did not teach a Copernican cosmology. He taught a biblical cosmology and that the stars are smaller, closer, and are going to fall to the earth. in the Bible, and if you say that it's not the stars, it's some meteor nights or comets or whatever, you're making up stuff because you are filtering that through a bias you've been brainwashed with in birth. All right? The Bible says the stars. Now, I was talking to a person who was a science teacher who's a, a strong Christian, and I said, I said, what about the stars falling to the earth? And he goes to, to Revelation 6, and he says, well, don't you think that's just what, what John was seeing was asteroids and meteorites falling? It wasn't really stars. And I said, well, I said, you got a problem with that. If you're going to say it's just asteroids and meteorites because Jesus said it was stars. So did Jesus know what he was talking about or not? So here's a place that seriously the Bible does not agree with the cosmology of this world system. NASA and everybody else. And what's amazing to me, let me just say this. What's amazing to me is that Christians have tried to mix the world system cosmology into Christianity and they don't work. You can't do it. And this is proof of that right here. And I'm going to show you what the atheists do. Now listen to this. This is Neil deGrasse Tyson again. One of your top astrophysicists, astronomers. And here's what he says about this issue of the stars, the Bible saying the stars fall. People who make this case that that was the beginning and that there had to be something that provoked the beginning, do you give them an A at least for trying to reconcile faith and reason? Um, I don't think they're reconcilable. What do you mean? Well, well so let me say that differently. All efforts that have been invested by brilliant people of the past have failed at that exercise. It just failed. And so I don't, I, I don't, the track record is so poor that going forward I have essentially zero confidence, near zero confidence, that there will be fruitful things to emerge from the effort to reconcile them. So, for example, if you, if you knew nothing about science and you read, say, the Bible, the Old Testament, which in Genesis is an account of nature, that's, that's what that is, and I said to you, give me your description of the natural world based only on this. You would say the world was created in six days, and that stars are just little points of light, much lesser than the sun. And in fact, they can fall out of the sky, right? Because that's what happens during during the um, revelation. One of the signs that the yeah. second coming is that the stars will fall out of the sky and land on Earth. So to even write that means you don't know what those things are. You have no concept of what the actual universe is. So everybody who tried to make proclamations about the physical universe based on Bible passages got the wrong answer. So what happened was, when science discovers things, and you want to stay religious, or you want to continue to believe that the Bible is unerring, what you would do is, you would say, well, let me go back to the Bible and reinterpret it. Then you say things like, oh, they didn't really mean that literally, they meant that figuratively. So this whole sort of reinterpretation of the fig how figurative the poetic passages of the Bible are, came after science showed that this is not how things unfolded. And so the educated religious people are perfectly fine with that. It's the fundamentalists who want to say that the Bible is the literally, literal truth of God, that, and want to see the Bible as a science textbook, who are knocking on the science doors of the schools, trying to put that content in the science uh, Enlightened religious people are not behaving that way. They're saying, yes, science is cool, we're good with that, and use the Bible for, to get your spiritual enlightenment and your emotional fulfillment. I have known serious religious people, not fundamentalists, who were scared when Carl Sagan opened his series with the words, The cosmos is all it is, or ever was, or ever will be. 
Mm-hmm. Maybe they scared them. Because they interpret that to mean that if this is it, there's nothing else. No God and no life after. For, for religious people, many people say, well, God is within you. Or God, there are ways that people have shaped this. Rather than God is a little gray-bearded man in the clouds. So if God is within you, what Shokal would say, in you in your mind. In your mind, and we can measure their neurosynaptic. Now we're going to move on from here. But you understand, see, you say, why does it matter? Because people have believed this instead of believing what God's word said, and many people have fallen away. They've walked away. People have said, I'm, I'm not following God anymore. I'm not a Christian. So now I'm going to show you a scientific proof about the firmament being a real thing in the sky. Our container, our dome, our celestial sphere that's in the sky, holding the stars, the moon, the sun. The air you are breathing right now proves that the firmament exists, okay? Because the only way to have gas pressure is with containment. Yet they're telling you that there's a vacuum in the sky that's sitting next to our gas pressure without a physical barrier. Also, you need to have containment to make a vacuum. But they are saying these things are coexisting and they're not equalizing. That breaks the second law of thermodynamics. The air we breathing proves that the firmament exists. Now, another biblical proof is the fact that the moon gives off its own light. It's not reflecting sunlight. In the Bible, it says, And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. So they are both lights. He didn't say, And God made one great light and one great rock. And I have the proof for that. So here's a video of a man using what's called a fleur. It's a forward-looking infrared. It picks up heat signatures, um, and he's going to use it in the moon's shade compared to the moonlight. And you will see that the moonlight is colder than the shade. Yeah, yeah. 18, 19 degrees, 19 degrees, 19, 7, 19, 8. In the moonlight, in the moonlight, 16 degrees, 15 degrees. Also in the moonlight, 17, 17. Well... What do you know? What do you know? Yeah, it's warmer in the shadow. Yes, absolutely no trickery going on here. It is an extremely bright moon out and the sky is crystal clear. Warmer in the shadow. If the moon were reflecting hot sunlight, then the moonlight should also be warm, just like the sun, but it's the opposite, proving that it's its own light. All right, I'm going to be playing for the rest of this video a compilation of biblical truths I put together. I'm going to show you the local sun and moon and that they're not that far away. You can actually have clouds behind the moon, which I have captured personally. Um, I'm going to show you stars. Um, and the reason why NASA never shows us videos of stars, of real stars, is because they prove the waters above. God said he put the stars in the firmament and that he put the firmament in the midst of the waters. And I see water when I look up at them with my high power zoom cameras. That's why stars twinkle. They're interacting with the water medium. I'm going to show you all, t all types of biblical proof. So yeah, this is why it's important because our natural world proves the existence of God. And this is why they've hidden it from us. Because if everybody knew where we lived, everybody would have to concede that God exists. So, it's very important. Thank you for watching. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also, and God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the fourth day. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, it's the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up.
Okay, look at that. Oh, it's really blue under there. It looks like a giant it's just explosion underneath all the water, and then it finally, you see where it breaks the tension of the water there? Yeah. That was cool. It's wherever the gas comes out of the bubble first. That's where it rushes out and then it immediately drains the bubble. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth. When he established the clouds above. When he strengthened the fountains of the deep. When he gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass his commandment. When he appointed the foundations of the earth. Then I was by him, as one brought up with him. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. Rejoicing in the habitable part of his earth. And my delights were with the sons of men. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. It came in the mail, and y'all are opening it with me. <laughs> Ooh. The Flat Earth map dates back over 1,000 years. This map is credited to being created by a Persian astronomer. His name was Al-Biruni and he lived between 973 AD to 1048 AD. It's the official map of the United Nations and also the United States Geological Survey. It used to be present in many places before the creation of NASA and the Antarctic Treaty in 1959. Here you see it with Admiral Byrd. This map has been restored by Dmitri from Russia with suggestions of mine, Idia Lenkar. Known by my YouTube channel Flat Earth Benjo, I asked Dmitri to include the Bermuda Triangle and Point Nemo, a place deep in the Pacific where NASA buries rockets. Then Robert Tazi, a professional mapmaker, came along and enhanced the map even more. There are many people now selling this map online, but if you could order it from my online store, I would greatly appreciate it. Visit my online store now and order one of the items. I humbly thank you.